one of the people on the board, uh, Kristen, she had, uh, she had called me and said, I'd like to come out and, and uh, be the guest speaker. And I was gonna come out anyway. I come out and watch some ball games. Um, I've worked with her son uh, doing some baseball lessons. So uh, it just seemed hand in hand out and, and, and talk about it. And also uh, give the people here some information on uh, what I've been trying to do for years is set up some batting cages where I can give lessons and, and teach some kids in the area. So we thought it was a good idea to at least, at least let everybody know that that's what I've been trying to do. And hey, if you have a building somewhere, let me know. I want to set up the commercial type cages where I put machines in and you can just come in and feed the machines and hit off the machines. That way, uh, anyone who wants to just come in and take a few rounds of hitting, they can get some practice in. Um, we can rent cages, bring a team in, hit off the machines, and that's a way to quickly get some work done instead of, especially when it's cold out. And then I'd have a cage where I can do lessons and, and uh, work with the kids and teach them the proper uh, mechanics of pitching and, and hitting. I did that back in Illinois and I always had uh, another cage area, batting tee set up, soft toss machines set up, where kids can go in there, practice a little bit, and then they can go and hit off the machine. Um, what I try to do is, is teach everyone how to teach themselves, so they understand what they're doing wrong, correct themselves when they're out there on the ball field. And when I do that in a lesson in the batting cages, um, they don't have to come in and get a lesson from me once they learn the correct things to do. They can come in if they're going to hit off the machine. If there's nobody in that practice cage, jump in there and practice. I'm not charging you to go do that. Um, you know, the idea is just to help them along. So go hit, go do the practice things that I want you to do, then go hit off the machines, that's fine. If, um, if I'm not doing a lesson and you're walking around and say, hey, uh, I'm struggling a little bit. I feel like I'm doing this wrong, that wrong. Jump in there, let me look at it. And that's the way I operated my cages back in Illinois. And, and uh, everybody loved that and kids got better. So that's the main thing. But I've been trying to do this for 16 years since I've been down here, but I couldn't find a building. And then I fell into a job where uh, I had to work and I just didn't have time. So. Right now, uh, I've got a friend of mine and, and uh, we're looking for a building. We just can't find anything that would work. Well, I love, I love working with kids. It's, it's just fun. Uh, it's fun to work with them. I always have my, uh, it runs in the family. My dad always did. I mean, he coached us when we were little. Uh, my brother was coaching kids when he was 17 and he didn't have to because he was still playing. Uh, he went on and played minor league ball and he still was coaching kids when he came back. He coached his kids. Um, I remember when the traveling teams first started way back when where instead of a league here, recreational league, uh, some, some dad started traveling teams where they go pick a team from the community and then they go play another community. Uh, and it's usually the best players, but it's a lot of traveling involved. That's what I was saying. And, uh, and the president was saying that the effort put in by the, the, uh, the families, the parents, the coaches, is phenomenal because there's a lot of driving going on and, and playing these games. And that's how you get better, you play better competition. So my dad was always uh, coaching, my brother's coaching. Um, I was always helping them uh, when I came back uh, from playing ball in the big leagues. And, and it just got to be fun. Uh, explaining the right mechanics of pitching and hitting uh, to kids because you can see you can see if they're doing something wrong and see how much fun it'd be if they started doing something right and uh, I started well back in Illinois I had batting cages and I gave lessons there and uh, that was a blast for me to see kids get better <clears throat> I mean the kids I work with then they all have kids now uh, so it's amazing to see, and then they teach the same thing, and so those kids are, are having success. The worst thing to happen is when kids are out here playing, they haven't got instruction or got some wrong information, then the game's not fun for them. 
And what I try to do is work with the parents also, what I teach the kids, and then explain it to the parents, and they can remind the kids during the course of the game. Instead of sometimes, I know parents get excited and they're hanging on the fence and yelling at their kids, do this, do that, and, and I tell the parents, I say, you do that, and the kids don't hear it anyway. Because everybody's yelling, they're out there on the field, they don't hear you. Uh, you know, I'm in front of, when I was pitching the big league, even though it's different, it's, but there's 50,000 people yelling, you don't hear them. Everybody says, are you nervous? No, you don't hear them. You hear a big noise, you hear some clapping or booing or whatever, but no, it doesn't, it doesn't phase you. Uh, it's just a lifestyle, basically, and, and the, uh, the level of play uh, is pretty much the same. I was at a very good college and going the double A, obviously the players, uh, there are more good players on the team. We were still very good in college, but it's different because you're playing every day. Um, it's a job now. Uh, you're getting paid to play. You have to find your own place to live. You have to get, your, uh, get yourself to the ballpark. You're, you're living a job, and it's still a game, and you're playing every day, and it's not like college where if you see a college game uh, or you see out, out here at the youth league games, there's a lot of rah-rah, um, especially college, a lot of yelling, um, a lot of cheering going on. In minor league baseball, professional baseball, you don't see that as much. You'll see the guys cheering when someone hits a home run, a good play, but there's not as much uh, activity, not as much uh, slapping each other on the back, uh, not as much handshaking, because you're playing every day, and your job is to win that day. If you lose that day, or win that day, you've got a game the next day, you forget about the day before. You just have to go on to the next day. So it's just becoming professional is what it amounts to. It uh, starts like every, every kid, you start playing catch with your dad in the backyard. Um, you play on little league teams, and at least they still have the same leagues, little league. In, in Illinois, where I'm from, it was little league, pony league, colt league, Connie Mack. They all name them something different, but it's just the age groups moving up. And I just kept playing like every kid does, kept playing at every level. Um, until I got to uh, get to high school and all of a sudden I grew a little bit more. I started throwing a little bit harder. So pitching became very important for me and, and uh, I was throwing, uh, throwing very hard. I had, uh, I had a good uh, senior year in high school and was throwing very well, but I got hurt. I broke my left arm. I'm a right-handed thrower. I broke my left arm playing first base. So I didn't get a chance to go to any college. Nobody really came looking for me. Um, so I went to a small junior college in Illinois. My brother was helping coach. So I played a year there, and uh, while I was playing in the summer leagues, an old Washington Senator baseball player who was our friend, uh, a friend of ours, lived in Springfield, Illinois, and he approached my, my uh, family and me and said, well, what, what are you doing pitching for this little junior college here? And so, well, we didn't have any other offers. Uh, he said, well, that's crazy. So he called the coach at the University of New Orleans, uh, who was a friend of his, and said, I've got some punk kid here that should be pitching somewhere else uh, and not here. So he called him. Uh, they gave me a scholarship sight unseen and I went down to the University of New Orleans and played. Uh, after my junior year, I was drafted by the Minnesota Twins and they took away in Orlando. I played the rest of the summer there and was invited to big league camp and made the team. So uh, that was the extent of my, my career getting to the big league. I played about four years with the Twins and then was traded to the Yankees. No, no, if you're, <laughs> you're just invited to spring training. Really, really there's a 40-man roster. Um, obviously, only X amount of guys are gonna be uh, in the big leagues, and the rest of them go back to triple A or double A or something like that. They usually invite some young players up to big league camp 
see if they can make it or more or less just to uh, let the manager and the coaches take a look at you and see if maybe they can call you up during the course of the year. But uh, I think what I was, when I was mentioning is um, I got the chance um, basically just kind of, when kids get drafted and sent to, they usually they get sent to rookie league. And rookie league is just a place where you go and you try to, uh, to learn what it is to be a professional ball player, uh, what's expected of you. You're playing every day. It's not like uh, it's a job, but it's also fun, but you're playing every day. So you, you have to get adjusted to that lifestyle. A lot of kids are coming out of, uh, they've never traveled before. They're coming out of a home where they want to stay at home, uh, never been away from, from, uh, from their house to their parents, and a lot of kids end up leaving. They'll leave and go home. Hey, we're, we're scared about being away from home. And that's why you have all these different levels. And also so you can learn the correct mechanics of pitching, hitting, uh, running the bases, learn that particular team's way of teaching baseball. So what they do is send them all to rookie league. They get adjusted to playing rookie league and hopefully they start moving up the ladder if they're good enough. Every team's got two or three A ball teams called class A farm team. So they could go to a low A, middle A, a high A team. And the reason all the teams do that, all the organizations do that, is because they can take uh, three teams worth of, of quality ball players, play them on different teams, and what their hope is the cream rises to the top. Then you'll get the best out of those three teams, and you can make one team out of it, and those guys are the ones going to double A. So that's, that's just the way the minor league system works. I was, I was blessed to go straight to double A. I skipped minor league camp, rookie league, all the A ball teams, I went straight to double A. And then what I was saying in my little speech out there is I was invited to the big league camp and the manager at that time, Gene Mock, had said that uh, basically he said, no punk coming out of college is gonna make my major league team. But I did everything right. And that's what I was explaining to uh, all the kids out there. I practiced played catch with my dad, my brother. Um, every chance I got, got out to the ball field and played. And if you learn the right way to do things, then it's, the game's a lot of fun. And you excel and you start getting better and better. So by the time I got to the big leagues, big league camp, I did everything right. And what the manager basically said was, I can't keep him out of the big leagues. And so that's how I made the team. Uh, it was with um, it was with Seattle uh, or against Seattle, and I threw maybe seven innings. Uh, I won the ball game. I think um, I don't know three to one, something like that. And uh, and the manager took me out after seven innings, so I got the win. Uh, I got the win there. So that was exciting because um, they were curious on what was going to happen to me in spring training in Orlando. Uh, no one scored a run off me. Uh, every game I pitched, I was in every game. Uh, I got people out, there was no run scored. Until we went on a western swing, we finished our spring training out in California. And I pitched uh, two games out there, and San Diego got a couple runs off me, and the manager said, that's good, now, now we know you're human. And, and uh, so he figured, I, this is what I wanted to see because you just breeze through spring training and it's not that easy. And the, and the manager, the pitching coach kept telling me, it's not that easy. You're getting everybody out right now, but it's going to hit you one of these days. And uh, so they were happy about me giving up a couple runs. Uh, no, never. Never. I, I uh, once you enjoy the game the way I did, and most kids do, and get to play at that level, it's just, uh, it's, the, uh, it's the best thing you can do. And I tried to stay in as long as I could. I, I, uh, I had some rough times, I hurt my arm a couple times, and, and maybe they were trying to get rid of me, but I kept trying to come back. Uh, after I played in the big leagues, I had hurt my shoulder, and, and it was tough to get back to the big leagues, so, once I got my shoulder back in shape, uh, I tried to get back into baseball, 
And that was a tough road to come back into because if you're injured and playing with a team, you get to hit the training room every day and get yourself back in shape. You get to go out and play catch, you get to run, uh, you have a training room. If you're not playing, if you're not signed by a team and you're hurt, you're on your own. You have to get your, you have to work a regular job and you have to try to get yourself in shape and get back. So I ended up playing ball in Mexico, in Italy, uh, went back to the minor leagues and trying to get back up there. But I kept hurting my shoulder. So there came to a point where I just said, that's enough. And I coached for a couple years and then uh, uh, didn't want to travel anymore. So I stayed at home. Um, well, first injury, I'll go back to the first injury. My first year in the big leagues, I pitched 266 innings and had 14 wins, 14 complete games, which is kind of unheard of. And especially for a 21 year old coming out of college, I had just thrown uh, 100 innings in college, 100 innings in double A, and then come to big leagues and, play, and pitch 260 some innings. So uh, it might have been a little bit overuse, but it was also, uh, they didn't like the breaking balls that I was throwing. I threw a curve and a slurve. They wanted me to throw a slider. And I think the way they showed it to me, I hurt my elbow. So my second year in the big leagues was not a good year. <laughs> my elbow was hurting. And so I got operated on at the end of that year. Uh, got it back in shape and I was fine. So I got to the Yankees and the Yankees weren't sure what to do with me when they traded for me. Um, they saw that I could get loose in a hurry, so they put me in the bullpen, and they liked me coming out of the bullpen a few times. They were trying to get me to be the setup man for Goose Gossies, our reliever. And I did that one game, and they said, this is great, and I thought now I'd be the setup man, a reliever. But all of a sudden, they needed a guy to start, and so I was back in the starting rotation. So I won four or five games in a row and feeling great. Uh, we got a new pitching coach. He noticed something he wanted to change in my windup and I was dumb enough to do it. And uh, that ended up hurting my, my throwing shoulder, which I would have kept pitching, but the manager said, no, I'm gonna put you on the disabled list. And it never got better. And I didn't find out till years later, it was a problem in my back that put pressure on my shoulder but I think I damaged my shoulder by pitching with that, that pain uh, for all that time. So I, I didn't have the zip on the fastball anymore. Uh, they weren't too keen on, on radar guns then. They didn't use it as much as now or on TV, but it was 90-91. And, and that was the old ray gun. Nowadays, they have a different type of gun they use for TV because they like to capture your interest on TV. You got guys throwing 100 miles an hour, which they probably don't. Uh, the radar gun on, on TV that they use, it catches the speed three feet out of your hand, so that's a little faster. By the time it gets to the hitter, it might be three, four miles an hour slower. Um, <clears throat> All I remember is, and we didn't have one with Minnesota Twins, or they didn't use one with the Yankees uh, per se. I mean, if they did, we didn't know, and, and you shouldn't care about it anyway if you're getting people out. But I just remember a few articles in the paper where I pitched a game, uh, two games when I was with the Twins, two games against Ronnie Guidry, who was with the uh, Yankees. And he had that tremendous year of 25 and three uh, with a one point nine ERA and, and he threw well he threw 95 96 so I remember the article after a game that I pitched against him it was called the battle of the thin men because he was 511 probably 175 pounds I was 63 probably 175 pounds so uh, they mentioned he was throwing 95 I was throwing 91 so I just go by that and uh, the same with a couple other articles. Um, Lynn Barker threw with Cleveland, threw 95-96. The same thing, I threw a good game against them, and they said uh, uh, Lynn Barker was throwing 95-96. Erickson was only throwing 91-92. <laughs> so uh, today's gun, I might have been on, on TV, 93, 94, 95. I don't know. 
Oh, I know it was hard enough to be in the big league. Well, it's a great lifestyle. I mean, they, they take care of you. Now, obviously, it's, it's really big time, but uh, to me, I was 21 in the big leagues. Um, uh, you fly all over the place. A lot of times it's a charter coming back. Nowadays, everybody has a charter um, uh, in and out, but uh, you're chartered everywhere. Um, you pack up your bags uh, after the ball game. The, uh, the uh, um, clubhouse manager takes your bags for you, throw them on the plane. Um, you pack up your bags, suitcase, uh, after a stay in the hotel. Um, the, uh, uh, the bellhop, somebody will come by because they're paid by the team, come get your suitcases, take them, put them on the plane. You don't have to worry about them. You don't have to keep your luggage. And usually in the big leagues, they always have a, what's called a kangaroo court. If somebody sees you carrying your own luggage, then they'll find you. Uh, one of the guys on the team, just to make fun of you. Hey, you got somebody that's going to carry him for it. And, and some, some young guys, and I did it before, I said, well, it's my suitcase. I was just going to carry it down to the lobby. And I said, no, the team pays for somebody to come pick it up. Let them pick it up. So we have the kangaroo court where they find you for, we find you a buck, you carry your own luggage, you numb that. But, uh, and at the time, meal money, um, at, well, at one time, I think it was like $80 a day was meal money. Now I think it's 200 and some dollars a day. And the, the way they gauge it is, is uh, the most expensive cities. I mean, you go to, to New York, uh, you might need to cab it to the ballpark or something. You shouldn't, you take the bus, but, but so you can be comfortable. Uh, I mean, it, it might be a $10 sandwich somewhere. You could buy. So they're trying to gauge it on what you might spend during the course of the day. Uh, and, and to me at that time, $40 a day was just crazy, or $80, I think it was $80 a day. Because the way most ball players were, I used to get up, I go to a new town, I want to see it. Go walk, walk around and see the, we're in a capital somewhere, I want, even, even the smaller towns like when I was in Double A. But um, uh, $80 a day, the majority of guys sleep in. Like you were just saying, you were almost, mid, you were sleeping. You know, if guys get up at, at uh, uh, let's say noon or one or something like that, by the time you shower, and you go down and you're probably eating lunch. So you eat lunch, the bus leaves for the ballpark at 3, 3.30, something like that. So you've eaten one day on $80. And in some of the smaller cities, not like New York, you might have paid $10 for lunch. So after the game, uh, the clubhouse manager puts out food for you to eat too because it's usually late. It might be 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning and they take you back to the hotel. In some cities, places are closed. So you might eat one day, or one time a, a day on that $80. And that was just amazing to me. You know, and you look at, hey, what do I do with the rest of it? Or you get on, a, you get on the, the plane and the, and the traveling secretary comes by, you're going on a 10 day road trip, he gives you an envelope, gives the next guy an envelope, you look at 800 bucks in there, 10 days, 80. So you got 800 bucks to, to, on food. And you're going, this is crazy. Nowadays, I'm sure it's 200 bucks. So, uh, and you're already getting paid to play. I mean, but that's in the contract. Hey, you got to pay them to eat too. Um, the only thing I might uh, is change is exactly that word, a change. <laughs> Throw a change up which um, everybody says you need a changeup. You do need a changeup. The idea of getting hitters out is to screw up their timing. So you need a change of speeds, fastball, curveball, changeup. Um, I was very stubborn and, and didn't want to throw a changeup. Uh, and that's kind of unheard of. And the manager kept trying to get me to do it and I was too stubborn. And so I won 14 games without a changeup. And, and it's just, it boggles everybody's mind because I was, I threw all fastballs. I'd mix in a slider once in a while. But, um, uh, and at that time I threw a fork ball too, which was a good change, but I, I just, 
I just didn't like throwing them. Uh, it just felt weird to me. And, and now, if I think back, because changeups made millionaires out of a lot of players. When, when uh, some of the pitchers started learning the split seam fastball, just a changeup. When they started learning that, guys that, that uh, were on the bubble of making it to the big leagues or were just an okay pitcher, all of a sudden became uh, great pitchers and, and uh, millionaires just because of throwing a changeup. So I should have I mixed in the changeup uh, earlier in my career. I was just too stubborn. Um, <clears throat> Well, I, I coached in the minor leagues for a little while, and then back home in Illinois, I ran the batting cages, and I had a little sporting goods store, pro shop. Uh, when I came down here, uh, I was driving to Atlanta and doing lessons, and that's just kind of crazy, driving all the way there, coming back and forth, back and forth. Couldn't find anything here, and I kind of fell into a job at a winery. So I ended up uh, helping the winemaker. Him and I were the ones that did all the the harvest work, the grapes coming in, crushing the grapes. Um, uh, he did the chemistry, but I helped move the wine around, make the wine, uh, bottle the wine, label it, deliver it, did the taxes. I did everything at that place. Um, uh, but it's just, uh, I'm kind of worn out. <laughs> as, as my doctor says, I'm getting older, so uh, I want to I wanted get this going and, and help some kids. So I started I fell into uh, helping a guy in Dawsonville. I'm going over there and, and helping, helping him. Uh, basically, I just rent out of space and I do some lessons there. And, and even that, it's not a big drive, but it's kind of a hassle driving back and forth. Uh, and I'm right here in Habersham. I live in Clarksville, so we're trying to find something here and just, just uh, uh, help the kids. You know, and I've got the equipment. I mean, we we considered talking to Haversham here and putting um, a commercial uh, machine out here. I'll give them a machine, put it up, but it's just that trying to figure out who's going to watch it. Um, uh, it's just that insurance fact. I did it before back in Illinois. It's just scary for nowadays for people. Well, you got a big machine out there. You don't want kids running around and. And, uh, and getting conked on the head by the machine because they're not paying attention. So um, it really has to be monitored so nobody gets hurt. If you recall where a manager went crazy, it was probably major league, crazy and he, he hit the, the spread, the table, and food went flying all over. They stole that from our manager, Gene Ma, uh, from in Boston. And we were in Boston, and um, we should have won the game. I don't know what happened where uh, well, he yelled at me for something. I didn't, I didn't do anything wrong. Uh, and and um, uh, so after the game, he was so mad. And really, if you lose a ball game, you shouldn't come into the clubhouse and tell a joke or laugh or this or that. You sit down, you, hey, you've lost. Uh, just, just lament a little bit about what happened. And, and, uh, and don't go right to the spread, start eating, <laughs> you know. And Gene Mock walks in and there's 10 guys around this spread and they're, and Boston had some good spread, good food. Uh, they had chicken, uh, french fries, uh, I don't know what else. They had a bunch of different sides, and they were everywhere. And and uh, um, Gene came in, and he said that stupid spread. He turns over the table, and uh, the chicken went in. A buddy of mine, Pete Redfern, next to me, and we weren't up at the spread. We were sitting in the locker. The fries went, and and the, the whole tray went into my locker. And then a couple other things are down the road. Some veggies are down the road. <laughs> All right. And, and, uh, and he was so mad, so everybody just chilled and some of them showered and laughed. And I'm sitting here looking down at this tray of french fries and <laughs> Pete Redford's over here looking at the chicken and I, we're looking around and Gene's back in his office. And, we go, hey, <laughs> and 
give me, give me a piece of chicken. <laughs> they say, hey, it's in our locker. You know, we didn't go up to that table. It can be 